the importing large uh, data sets panel. Uh, we have uh, seems to be now kind of an annual tradition to uh, update on uh, what the systems are and what the different approaches are and what, the, what are some of the improvements in the community. Uh, so this is really more about um, a discussion rather, you know, panel discussion, but also more of a round table with the community. Uh, we're looking for any kind of input experiences you might have had. Um, the way this uh, originally came about, there is uh, three companies being represented here, and I'll let everybody introduce themselves. But as we were consulting and reaching out into the community and uh, trying to understand what everybody was uh, doing and how they were approaching it, uh, there is three very distinct ways that we approach uh, data imports based on both what the clients and the organizations that we're dealing with give us and also based on some of the different tools that we have preferences uh, to use. Um, and the reason why this, uh, if you haven't, if you're kind of new to either data import or c data conversions or new to CVCRM, part of the reason why this topic uh, even exists is because if you try to use the built-in uh, import functionality, um, while it's nice and it's uh, cool to have and uh, a lot of end users can utilize that themselves, um, there is some scalability issues and some flexibility issues and especially if you get, if you get into um, truly large data sets on the scale of tens of thousands of records and I say records specifically not necessarily contacts because that might be contacts, contributions, uh, event registrations, all of the ancillary data that's coming in. Um, that's definitely going to tax your system and the structures and everything else that you're trying to import. So uh, not saying that the built-in functionality that's in CVCRM isn't usable. Um, if you have a simple spreadsheet or something like that, you can certainly use that. Uh, but when you get into the more complexity, there is different approaches to be had here. So with that, I'll hand it over at the end, do a quick intro, and then we'll go kind of round robin on what we do. Sure. Uh, my name is John Goldberg. I work for Plante Technology Cooperative, and my main work there is data migrations to CIVI CRM. I'm Nicola Ganive. I uh, work at CIVI Desk, and I'm doing lots of imports as well. Anytime we um, have a new customer coming in, uh, they need data imports. That's uh, one constant. I'm Mark Hanna, senior developer at Square. Uh, Thanks to Lord Nicholas, we have to handle a lot of uh, custom import situations. So, talk about strategies we devised to do that. And I'm Peter Petrick with Square. Uh, I've mostly played the role of a moderator on the panel and then on the audience side. So, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to John and let you talk about uh, your approach. I think what we'll do here on the panel is we'll go uh, individually, one by one, talk about uh, the approach that we've used. Uh, maybe five or so, ten minutes of show and tell, and then uh, we'll convert over to more, again, of a discussion, Q&A, et cetera. All right, Nicola, it's all you. Okay, so uh, I'm usually second or last in the presentation, and <laughs> by the time you've been through with these guys, you've seen all kinds of uh, really complicated stuff, uh, what's called ETL for Extract, Transform, and Load which is kind of an industry acronym for all of this. You know, we're going to take some data somewhere, we're going to massage it, and then we're going to push it somewhere else. Um, the reality for my customers is a lot simpler than that. Uh, I'm, I'm working mostly with uh, small and medium nonprofits. They don't have an IT department. They don't have IT skills. Most of the time, what they're coming with um, is a simple set of Excel files. Um, they can be f anywhere from, I would say, 3 to 30. Uh, most of the time, it's closer to the 30 mark because uh, every person in the organization has their own three, four spreadsheets they're using. And that's what we have to deal with. And then, of course, you know, they all work with the same people. So people, you know, the person that's in charge of memberships have their spreadsheet of members. And then the person that's in charge of event registration have uh, their spreadsheets for the event attendees, and these are the same persons. They're not spelled in the same way. They don't have the same email address, etc. But they are basically the same person. 
Um, so uh, dealing with small and medium customers, my uh, it's really a question of how can we do it fast and cheap. That's what they need most. So um, the uh, idea I had based on those needs was to um, create a scripted import and to be able to describe this scripted import with an easy language, kind of a smarty, if you use templating engines before, kind of a smarty for data imports into CVCRM. Um, in order to make it easy, uh, the first thing is to standardize all of these spreadsheets. So the first name column is always spelled first name in the same way, last name, the company name is still company name, organization name, or whatever you want, but always the same across all of these spreadsheets. Um, when you get to phone numbers, it's a little tricky, because as you know, uh, when you have phone numbers in CVCRM, they need to be associated to a location. So it's not simply a phone number, it's your home phone, or your work phone, or your main phone. So the name of the column has to match this, and you say main phone or main email, and then the system will know how to import it into CVCRM. So by using, sorry, these conventions, the time to massage the data is greatly reduced because we already know what's in that column based on the name of that column. Second um, way to make it easy, use language constructs. Um, so we decided early on on using PHP as our templating language. It is a templating language, right? Everybody is putting a lot of things on top of PHP, but PHP itself is supposed to be a templating language. So um, we've developed our import scripts in PHP and everything is coded with PHP structures. Makes it easy. Um, we're using Excel quite a lot. Um, in fact, those guys are gonna walk <coughs> you through transformations and we found out that a lot of these can either be performed in Excel or at least with Excel we can gain sufficient um, um, changes that the data is already a lot cleaner. So we're using lookup tables, we're using splitting uh, columns. For example, if you have first name and last name attached, very easy in Excel to cut a column by the spaces and then have these in multiple columns. So we're using Excel a lot. It's quick, it's dirty, but it works for our uh, customer base. And then finally, we are writing functions all the time. So every time we have uh, an edge case, we put it in a function in PHP because then we can reuse it. A typical example is how to split a name in Arabic-speaking countries. And we've had that a lot with customers in the United Arab Emirates, and so they have these very long names, and they have the name of the father, and the name of the family, and the name of the tribe, and all of this is together. It doesn't fit in CVCRM. It has to be first name, middle name, last name. So all the mapping we had to put in a function, and then we can reuse it. So typical membership file, we get membership file, event registration files almost almost always look the same. Um, so that's typically the information you have in one row of Excel. Um, and if you look at it, uh, this impacts quite a lot of tables into CVCRM. So just one row in Excel, we'll end up creating several contacts, we'll end up creating several relationships, several phone numbers, phone numbers might have to be duplicated. So for example, you might have to have that phone number not only attached to the person, but also to the organization that person is associated with. Um, and addresses, websites, phone numbers, and then of course the membership itself with a type, start date, and end date. Um, how we deal with such a file uh, you can actually see a, a piece of code from a real import here, and that's our templating language. Um, so starting from the top and very quickly, the file name is, you know, where do we get this information from? And then we have a field map that kind of maps all the fields to CVCRM entities. Um, so org1, uh, we know it's an organization, and uh, we have this um, 
field organization function that brings out all the default fields that we created in the system, so those standard column names. So just by inserting this line, the import script knows it's going to look for an organization in the file. It's going to have those standard column names, and it's going to build it. The resulting contact ID is going to go into the org1 um, variable, if you wish, and then we can reuse this later on. So if you look down at the uh, phone number, the third one uh, from the top, uh, you're going to see org1 vertical bar IND1, and that basically going to mean the fax number we associated to an organization if an organization was created. If not, we'll associate it with the individual. Um, um, that's roughly how it works. We have a membership on the organization. We have a different membership on the individual for this uh, particular customer. Um, and um, we can have some <coughs> constructs like if you look at the last email, it's basically saying if we have a membership on the organization, then we want the email to be associated with the organization. Um, if we don't have a membership on the organization, then we don't care to associate an email address with the organization. So it's kind of the language we're using, and from a very simple uh, PHP array, we can completely configure an import for a membership file um, very quickly, all using defaults. Some of the um, uh, um, functions we can add, so kind of going behind the curtain, how you define those additional functions, like splitting the Arabic names earlier. Um, that's another function we uh, have in here. It says or above. And basically what this says is if I have a value on that line for this column, take it. If not, take whatever we used in the previous row. And this is very often done in membership files because usually they have the name of the organization on the first contact and then all of the employees of this organization are listed underneath but not the organization itself. It's not repeated. Um, and so that's how we deal with this. And so uh, a simple logic like that uh, can be expressed in a few lines of PHP. Again, wrapped in a reusable function. We wrote it once. We're using uh, it on any import file that has, you know, those take the value that was above uh, kind of uh, things. Um, so since we're doing this talk every year, uh, since last year, we had uh, new things that came in. We're dealing with more entities. So we had to import pledge with multiple payments associated to the pledge. Um, that was not possible before. We've added that feature. Uh, we can import campaigns. Um, we can actually mass create campaigns. We worked with a radio station. And it looks like every couple of weeks they have a new uh, fundraising campaign going on. Um, and so they had like massive 300 campaigns in their files. And so we had to create some special logic around this. Um, we do uh, address normalization outs ourselves. We used to use external services. We found that they were slow because they have to be called over web services, not very reliable all the time. So we wrapped a simple uh, normalization function. So all of our addresses, we recognize boulevard with all of the different spellings you can have for that and then wrap it in a single boulevard um, um, text. Uh, so it's easy for us to find duplicate addresses in a file and do deed up on the addresses. We have cross-table lookups. Um, we do SQL imports. We had to do an import from the IMIS system, which is uh, quite complicated, and Allegiance, which seems to be even worse. That was for the <laughs> radio station, if anybody used Allegiance before. Um, and we're starting to go into importing on top of an existing database, which means we're not only doing the DDoP from the set of files we get from the customer, but we're also going to CVCRM and checking for matching records in CVCRM before importing. So we're starting to do that. We've already done it on like five entities so far, like the address, uh, individual organization, household, of course, um, contribution, membership, and maybe a couple others. 
Um, and we'll get more and more entities with DDoP from CVCRM. Um, and that can then enable sync functions like we were discussing before, because then we can sync some a continuous flow of Excel spreadsheet with an existing CVCRM database. Yes, so what sort of size of data can you process? So I've imported, uh, my largest import was 750,000 records, and it took about uh, six hours to import. Yes, in the back. Um, so for me, on the imports, I don't really care how long it takes to run. I care how long it takes to set up and configure. So uh, maybe you could speak to um, having these tools, using them, how long it would take to do a, a simpler or a complex one, like setting up that IMS import, for example. So um, the I would say the largest amount of time is spent into understanding where to get the data from the customer's files. Because uh, then, you know, creating the mapping, you've seen it. It's simple PHP files. You know, even for very complex data imports, the amount of code I have to write in this configuration file never exceeds a few pages in my text editor. Because it's basically mapping, you know, at, at a high level, we've got an organization or we've got a membership. And then because column names are the same, um, it, it works. And so for IMES, I had to write SQL queries and the, the, I, I picked every column as and then the standard naming I'm using in my scripts. Um, so the hardest part really is understanding where to get data from the customer's database, then the configuration itself on our side very quickly, very quick. Thank you. So while I'm setting this up, I actually maybe want to draw back a little bit and talk about some of the stuff that maybe we're taking for granted uh, when we're when we're talking about this, which is what what do you you know some of these tools are fairly advanced uh, uh, options, but what are, what are you, what are your options available to you if you maybe need to do this once and it's not uh, it's not uh, something you're going to have to do for a living. Uh, so, so I wanted to bring up that there are a couple of tools available to you that are beyond what the uh, the built-in import tool op offers. One of them is a uh, command line CSV import tool that uses the Civi CRM API. So it works on an entity. So your data has to be split up. Uh, if it goes in your contacts table, you have to put it in a contact CSV. If it's a contribution or an address, it needs to go into an address or a contribution CSV. Uh, on the one hand, that's splitting things up into more tables than you might have to do if you're doing an import through the GUI. But the advantage to this is that there's all sorts of stuff that's not available to you through the GUI. I'd say the most common use case for that would be if you have uh, a set of data where people are in 20 or 50 groups and you need to import all of them into all of their groups at once. Right now through the import, uh, the, the standard import, you can add everybody in your import to a group, but that's not usually what folks need when they want to do a, a group import. But by splitting out your group data into a separate CSV file, you do get that ability. Uh, for folks who don't need and are not comfortable with the command line, there's also an extension that Eileen wrote uh, that is the A, uh, the API CSV GUI import tool. Uh, it gives you the same capability, but it wraps it in uh, a user interface that you can use through the web, and you can pull in anything to an entity, which is great if maybe you've got all of your data and the only thing you need is to just get that set of groups pulled over and everybody needs to go into one of 100 different groups. Uh, so with that said, let me talk about how uh, my, my approach builds on top of this idea that if you get data into CSV files, then you can let Civi CRM take care of the rest. I use a tool called Kettle. Uh, Kettle is an ETL tool. I actually learned about it. Alan's giving me the thumbs up. I learned about it from Alan's partner, Young Jin, four years ago at CiviCon. Uh, it was probably the most influential workshop I've ever been to at any conference in my life in terms of <laughs> in terms in terms of my work. Um, 
uh, Kettle is a tool, is, is an ETL tool. And the, the most common use for ETL tools out in the world is you've got 10 databases out there and you need to put all the data together into one thing so that you can run reports across all of it. And all the data is in a disparate format, which is not that different from some of the things that I need to do or some of the things that I heard when we were asking questions at the beginning, right? Uh, you need to pull in data that's in a different format. You need to move things over. Maybe you need to rerun something multiple times. ETL is really set up to do the do something multiple times. Uh, Nicola's, you saw Nicola's rebuttal to it before you actually saw this, and I think it's an accurate statement. Uh, ETL is very configurable and very powerful and can also have quite a steep learning curve. Uh, that said, uh, to think about when Joe is asking the question of how long does something take, I find that the m most of my time goes into understanding the data with the client. What is this field? What is it used for? And that the actual scripting takes less time. Uh, when my use cases are more closely aligned with what Nicola is saying, I'd say it's about a comparable amount of time. But I find that often my client's data doesn't fit that neatly. Uh, for instance, when you're importing, as I was earlier this or last week, uh, Razor's Edge data about participants, uh, there's a separate field for is volunteer, is coordinator, is participant, is speaker. Uh, in CVCRM, we would store that as a participant status. And now, Nikolai, you may have written a function to, to handle that, um, and I'm sure that's how you would do that in your system. And I would say that it's it's very comparable here where I'm going to uh, make one of these. You can see all these little blocks up on the screen. Uh, this is actually uh, this is actually one large job that does an entire salsa migration. I can open up any one of these blocks, and for instance, here's here's my salsa groups transformation. And each one of these blocks performs a step, and it's very similar to doing a step in Excel. Uh, the difference between using Excel and using this is that. This is, this is now scriptable. I can run this multiple times. So thinking about what Chris was asking, what do you do when you need to run this multiple times? It's very common for me because I'm doing migrations from other systems that people are using every day. And so I might be in the process of, process of a six month build and I need to show them what their data looks like at a one month and two month point, but I can't, I can't rely on that data not changing between now and then. So I need to have a script that can blow away the database and rebuild it from scratch. Uh, and you can, you can do that uh, using, using Kettle. Uh, so to very quickly just look at, this is, this is uh, I guess it's a little fuzzy. Are folks able to read that at all? No. <laughs> no, I mean, if I can't read it, Even you can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll describe it and I'll use the cursor to point, but I'm not gonna try and rely on you all reading stuff. Um, we're starting here, uh, so Kettle can start with one of a number of different sources. Uh, in this case, when I do a Salsa migration, um, I'm not using the Salsa API. What I'm doing is I say I have a documentation sheet, and it's, it's aimed at other Civi CRM partners or implementers who have never looked at Salsa before. Here's the menu you go to. Here's what you click. Here's the columns you export. It turns out I actually, one of my clients who I was starting this process with, I made an offhand reference to this sheet. Um, to this documentation, and it's on our website. And they actually handed me over the CSV files. And they were just, I mean, they're not technical. They were, uh, you know, just a savvy end user. So, so we start with those CSV files. Hopefully, maybe in the future, we can work from an API. When I work from other tools like Razor's Edge, I do actually pull directly from the database. Um, here, the first thing I'm doing is I'm renaming the fields. Uh, and then uh, this step is a database lookup step. This is like a VLOOKUP. This is, I am actually taking the field that is originally um, called the supporter ID, and, I'm, and, and I've renamed it to external identifier in this step where I'm just listing my steps and I'm giving them a new name, which is the second column. And then in the third step, I'm saying, actually look this up directly against Civi CRM and say, find that external identifier against the context external identifier. So now right off the bat, I've got, the, I've got their Civi CRM contact ID, not their Salsa contact ID in my CSV, uh, which means that when I do future lookups against any other data I might have to do in Civi CRM in the course of this script, I'm actually looking it up against the Civi CRM contact ID. Um, I then, uh, this is a filter step where I can filter out records with no contact ID. 
Uh, it's very common. Salsa does not do good data validation on input. So there's a lot of crap data that um, Salsa migrate. Like folks who are you move, migrating from Salsa are often willing to drop these contacts because they, they don't have any, they, they might have no first name and last name and email. <laughs> so um, I do a cleanup where I change the plus to an underscore in the group name because Civi likes that better. And then I and then I can actually look up the group ID in Civi CRM uh, based on the group name. And then what I do here, this is this I split things and I say if you found a group ID, then I'm basically going to go down this list and the the remaining steps in this in this branch basically say if this group and contact ID already exist in Civi CRM, that means I'm reimporting again over my same data and don't try and import the same group twice. Um, but if you did not find a group ID, take all of the names for which you did not find a group ID and pass them. And basically here I sort them and just get the unique ones. And then I make a CSV file called invalid groups. That drops into a Dropbox folder, which I'm sharing with my client. And I say, hey, after we created these groups, here are the ones that still didn't come across. And so maybe we missed them in our discussion. Can you just take a quick look at them? Um, and then this step, this last step is disabled, but this is actually a new step that um, I believe Ixium wrote uh, for Amnesty International. This is actually a, a Civi CRM. Uh, I can actually put information directly from Kettle into Civi CRM. I'm doing that in other places here as well, but this step is cool because it works over the REST interface. So it's, it's web-based. It's a little bit slow. I wouldn't use this for importing 50,000 contacts. But it's it's a nice step that I can say, okay, if I know that all the group names that are in my in my export from Salsa actually should be in Civi CRM, I can just enable this step by clicking on that little arrow uh, in between these two steps, and it'll automatically generate all those groups for me in Civi CRM. And this is actually a very common thing I end up doing for all, for option value lists, prefixes and suffixes. Right, I get this contact data, and it's got ambassador and senator and reverend, and I just tell Civi, I tell Kettle, take all of the pre look up all your prefix IDs. If you see one you don't recognize, put it in a list, and then I'll have a step that'll say, okay, the ones that maybe are misnamed, I'll rename, and I'll show you that in a moment. But then all the others create those in Civi CRM, so that when I do an actual import, they're there. Um, the, 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 the ability to use, so, and this is the advantage to this over, over Nicola's approach, I would say, is that I don't have to have as deep an understanding as Nicola does of, of the, of the API or even PHP. Um, I, you can, you can do this with basically just an understanding of the database structure of Civi. Uh, I want to show one or two other quick things. Um, also, especially because most of the things I've talked about are things that if you heard my, me talk last year, you've heard already. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about is this Civi CRM input and output step. Uh, this was developed in the last year. It is a Kettle plugin specifically for Civi CRM. And this is a sort of unexciting one because I'm just creating uh, group names. But I put in my REST URL, my site key, and my API key. I'm actually pulling those from a variable from my larger job. Uh, and then I say I want to create group entities and the values that I want, and I could pick fields from my, from my stream and say create these fields and map them exactly. Uh, like I said, this is over the REST API. It is very slow compared to um, doing things via the, uh, the, the command line API import. Uh, so I don't use this for importing 100,000 contacts. I, am, I use this for importing 50 option list values. Uh, but what's nice is that I can do it live in the process of an import without the additional steps. Uh, those additional steps, by the way, are automated. You can see here I've got a step here that says upload the CSVs to the dev server. Uh, this will actually do an SFTP operation, move the steps. And then I've got steps like this that will actually run a... Uh, a, 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 a script and I can, I can open this up and this says run SSH commands and you're not going to be able to read this, but I'm actually running this script on the remote server. And this is just calling the, uh, the PHP, uh, import the, the import script that's in C then that's in Civi 
to take the data I just uploaded and run it. I don't do this, but you can also use this headless where you can say, okay, run this on the server and just monitor a certain folder. So if you have a script that automatically downloads your, you know, something that needs to be imported on a weekly basis, you can, um, you can just make sure that it gets dropped in a folder. This script will pick it up, run it, and get the data into Civi. So one thing that's new is that Civi CRM import and export script. Uh, another thing that's new is just that I've been concentrating on reusability. Uh, and there's a bunch of steps. These are on my GitHub. But a, uh, a good example here is my email cleanup. This is, a, this is a step, I've built a step that I drop into any of my other migrations that does things that I, I find email, there's, there's very common email cleanup problems. And by dropping this step in, I can clean up all sorts of email problems. Uh, so the first thing is email addresses sometimes need to be trimmed. So I trim them. Uh, these steps just deal with remapping the location type, and I'm going to skip over them. But then I've got this step called fix common email problems. And a lot of these are regular expressions. Some of them are just search and replace. Uh, but often an email address will be in single quotes, or it'll be at Gmail, but not at gmail.com, or it'll be at gmail.cm. And these are very obvious problems that we can spot and fix. Uh, Somebody who has, who's John at Gmail comma com, also very common. Uh, prefixing with a mail to, because somebody just copied from a website. All of these get fixed. I can drop this step into any of my other migration scripts. And the unfortunate part of that is that they, these folks may have already been marked as bouncing in Salsa. And now we have to decide, do we mark these folks as bouncing when they might not, in fact, be bouncing? Or do we risk increasing our bounce rates on a new Civi installation because now all these email addresses that didn't used to work for them are now magically working for them. And then I very quickly through, through here, I just, I, this step checks to make sure that it's a, a valid email formatted, a, a valid email format. It can actually test the email address itself. I don't do that. Um, and then I filter out the invalid emails again to a Dropbox so that my client can see them and then the rest all get dropped into a valid email CSV, uh, which then can be imported automatically with the script. Um, the other thing I've done in the last year, two, two more things. One is uh, I've, I've concentrated on uh, an automated Salsa migration. Uh, Salsa <laughs> is real messy. I'm actually going to pull up a, an anonymized. Uh, this is just a, um, this is just a uh, basically the equivalent of the contacts table. And it's got about 80 fields when you include all of the custom fields that are out here. And of course, some of them are in the same format as Civi and some of them aren't. Uh, but I've written something that takes all the standard fields, maps them to their Civi equivalents, and then takes their custom fields. You can actually export the custom field descriptions from Salsa. And I generate the custom fields programmatically in Civi, including the option lists and including the data types. So now when I'm pulling the data over, I can actually pull in their custom fields. If I'm assuming I'm not gonna change their custom fields, sometimes part of my job is to make them better. But if I just wanna pull the data over as is, I can actually pull that over as it was in Salsa into Civi without even looking at what the custom fields are. And that's transformed into this? That's on my GitHub. That is one of the things I would love to see other people using. There's about 2,500 Salsa customers that are all pissed off because of what I talked about yesterday. <laughs> and I can't possibly move them all. So keep, people, please please take that script. <laughs> What's it called again on your GitHub? Uh, I think I've got a, a repository called Kettle Transforms. And in there, there's a folder called Salsa. The documentation is weak. Uh, and you know I'm not saying it works perfectly, but it's, it's, it's the transforms I use. I just got another salsa migration job, so in the next couple of weeks you can expect improvements. Um, and you know, feel free. If, I don't think that somebody who hasn't used Kettle before is going to just step in and see these and be like, "Okay, I can now magically migrate salsa with no additional knowledge." Uh, but for those of you who are doing this, it's it's out there. Um, I'm also doing this for Razor's Edge, although that is a much more complicated job and has a lot more. Uh, judgment calls that go on a per client basis. And it was the client uh, giving a CSV export from their Salsa account. 
Yes. Right. And and the docu and there there's a very detailed documentation of, of exactly what you do and don't need to export. Um, I'm going to take Joe, and then I'm going to say the one last thing I was going to say. Okay. Um, it's actually a question for all of you. So it's uh, have you got other ones for pop other scripts that can be shared for popular imports like Nation Builder, or actually I have already done an IMIS uh, import, and I'd like <laughs> uh, to see what uh, you know you've done, Nicola. So uh, what can you share for popular formats? Um, Allegiance, IMIS, I put these on the slides. Uh, that's what I've done. The, the rest was, yeah, I've done a few other systems, uh, donor perfect, etc. but these were, you know, one-off imports. So Thank you. nothing structured there. Yeah, I, I have the Salsa, I have MailChimp and Constant Contact, but those are trivial. Um, I'm working through Razor's Edge. Uh, I'm actually doing, Razor's Edge is one of these pieces of software where people don't use 90% of the functionality, but which 10% they use changes from person to person. Um, so my Razor's Edge is going to be very incomplete, but actually covers a lot of the key stuff. Um, I've also conversed with Youngjin at Mphanos, who seems to have uh, some Razor's Edge stuff as well. Um, I think one uh, one topic or one subject here is that uh, we're talking about importing large data sets, but as you, you're listening to the conversation here, uh, the import actually is the very last step. And there is a whole bunch of other stuff that happens before, and uh, a lot of people tend to think, uh, especially the newcomers to any system, really any CRM systems, tend to think, oh yeah, import, that just means I click a button and I give it something and it just knows what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, whether you're doing this just for your organization, whether you're an implementer and are doing multiple of these imports, uh, it's important to realize and, and communicate with your client that, uh, that just the data mapping, understanding what data is coming over, uh, how it's formatted, uh, how many different files it's in, uh, you know, where are all the different sources, uh, that's a critical part of the process. You can't import into, until you do the data mapping. Uh, another big step is data cleanup. Do you bring everything in and then try to clean it up? You know, that sometimes may be the only option because you're bringing it from such disparate sources that trying to clean up ahead of time is nearly impossible. Um, other times you might say, wait a minute, we part of the reason why we're putting in a system is to have uh, better data. So, you know, how do we do some of the transformation and what tools do we use for that? Um, so all of that has to go in place before you actually hit the button and say, okay, now we're ready for import. And then from that standpoint, you know, you've got the, the kettle approach, which is a combination of scripts and REST API, et cetera. Uh, you've got the PHP approach. You can do the command line approach. A um, couple of approaches we've taken, so we'll speak specifically to those. Um, one is uh, if, if you do have that ability, um, importing either tapping into the existing database of some kind, and we've, we've done it uh, in a couple of cases with, let's say, AS4, AS400, uh, where they were migrating their data out of that and into CVCRM. Um, you can actually recreate the table structure, put it in, and then uh, with SQL scripts, basically match it up to the, uh, to the CV database. Uh, that's one option, especially if you're dealing with uh, with large uh, number of data. That's that's very helpful. Again, if you're doing it through either a, a REST call or through the um, through the uh, interface, uh, the general rule of thumb is you're talking hundreds, maybe a few thousand records. But if you've got tens of thousands or or, or hundreds of thousands of records, um, that GUI is not going to be that helpful. Uh, it's just gonna you're gonna run into server memory issues, timeouts, PHP timeouts. You, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot lot more problems. And uh, you know we've had uh, people approach us and say, yeah, this this would mean we'd have to split up our file and our import into you know 75 uh, actions, and then you know look at the error logs and try to fix it up and do it. And it, that's just it doesn't scale. Um, so one of the approaches we've taken is bring all the data again if it's mapped out relatively well if it's coming out of a database that is 
relatively easy to understand. You bring it into uh, your MySQL, and uh, then you write, and you have a set of scripts, and you know we've got you know fix emails, do this, do that, transform things, or you know maybe everything in their old database is all uppercase, and uh, they they want to normalize it um, and transform it. So you can put all of that in, in in the SQL functions or in a script, or wrap it into PHP and then run it in. Um, if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of records, um, you're going to have to do something more automated. And it's uh, to Joe's point, it's not as much you know what does it take to run run it in. You know whether you have hundred thousand records or a million records. Once you kick it off and you know it works, then it's just a matter of waiting, um, and hopefully you know you don't have the timeout issues. Um, so that's that's one approach we've taken, and then we've got another approach through the batch API, and I'll let Mark talk kind of specifics to that. And there is not really much to show behind it except to share the experience of, yep, put it in a table, running a SQL query is much more efficient than trying to do it via GUI or via a REST call or something like that. And uh, we've got a batch API for um, from the Drupal side. So oftentimes customers need to update data on a monthly basis or uh, maybe quarterly or whatever. And uh, we try to provide infrastructure and automation so that the customer can handle that themselves and not have to uh, be doing that for them. So we've uh, over time developed uh, sets of Drupal modules to uh, provide that infrastructure and use the uh, I mean, to speak to what Peter said, to get the customer needs is extremely important to help automate their process so that we can provide the technological infrastructure to make that possible. And uh, once we understand their needs and uh, help them standardize a format, then we can uh, customize uh, our basic infrastructure to uh, basically allow them to either just upload a file and hit import and use the Drupal batch API or uh, tie into an API or some other thing to uh, to automate that process for them. Yeah, and in, in that case we've done a couple of different approaches one is you know we can go in and uh, grab their file so it's it's still a GUI interface uh, but again as Mark said it's a Drupal module so it's using the, the batch API which means it doesn't time out you have to keep the browser open and the files up there and it keeps running and it takes time it's not the most uh, time efficient or resource efficient uh, process necessarily but it is something the client can do uh, the client's not going to be probably running a command line PHP script I don't think you'd want them to do it on a server and I don't <laughs> think they're going to be running you know their own installation of kettle either uh, so this is something where we have clients that on a monthly or quarterly or semi-annual basis are getting tens of thousands of records they have no control over what comes out and what type of data is in there so we try to provide a facility for them to manage it so they don't always have to rely on us um, because they want to you know for for one reason or another that's uh, that's what they desire so we kind of codify that and in the module uh, have some variables and settings that then we can reuse questions comments I think we've got about 15 or 20 minutes what Drupal modules uh, just stuff we've developed. Uh, I've used the model entity as a template to make some entities and then provide a file field as was so on, uh, you know, uh, entity insert, then uh, read that, that file and, and run a batch API process. There's documentation on the uh, drupal.org on how to uh, set up the batch APIs. It's relatively simple. It's a and few functions. And the benefit there also is, um, when we're doing this, we have the ability to set up user accounts, send out emails, and do other do other things that uh, tap into the, the Drupal side of, of the installation as well. So this is not a pure, hey, let's load your CRM system. It uh, it can have other functions associated with it. Would it be possible to take that batch API and tie it into cron so that you could actually run it, you actually have it set up the batches and then run it in the background so that you don't have to have the browser sitting open to do it? It's possible, but if you wanted to do that, maybe do a drush. We we do that with my gripe, like a module and so do my gripe that our links put together and yeah, we we run daily scripts that pull an export from the client system and run my grade across it, which also you've got full power of, you know, Drupal user accounts, whatever else you need to do, transforms and stuff. Mm -hmm. One of, the, one of the challenges we faced early on with this kind of 
especially with large data sets, uh, was being able to inspect the transformations along the way, the cleanup steps, the normalization steps, all of those things, when we write in code, um, can be quite a challenge, right, if you're going through many different steps to, to stop at this step. I mean, you get to the end and you find out it's not what you want, right? Something didn't go right. Well, where in that process did not go right? And kind of debugging that. I wonder if you guys could share your, your different experiences with that kind of problem using the technologies that you use. So we provide a log, you know, that like a, so that the customer, we provide a log so that the customer can review the results of the import as they go. Did this... Uh, did the did the contact import cleanly? Did the membership import cleanly? Did the user get created? Did all these all, every step of the way, and you can look for patterns, and you can know oh, well, those two didn't go right. Why? Maybe it was dirty data. Maybe it was something new in the data we didn't account for, and that's a way to uh, handle that situation. Right. And then when you find something didn't go wrong, then actually being able to find out where it didn't, didn't go right. <coughs> To find out where it didn't go right. 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 So, so like, like uh, whatever key they're using to on the data, if they're having an external ID of some kind, we can say, oh, that number, uh, that row didn't go right. So it's kind of a, kind of a traditional debugging process. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our issue is generally with the data coming in, not, not necessarily in the process because, again, the things we've written is more repetitive. So once we know we've got something in place, it's, it's uh, pretty much ready to go. It's more the data coming in, so they might have a new membership type, or we had a client who, for whatever reason, the their external ID people or the, the membership ID people registering for their event mm. were using the same membership ID over and over and over. It was like five 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 five. I don't know why that was a popular number, but out of hundreds of people, you know, twenty five chose that particular number as a placeholder for their membership ID. And our logic was written in a way that was trying to match it up to, to the membership ID. So what ended up happening 24 times, we overwrote the same context. <laughs> and you know, out of the 25 people, only one could log in and update their information, and the other 24 are going, hey, I can't log in. So we had to go back and say, wait a minute, what's taking place here? Go back to the source data. And that, that's not something you're going to catch, even no matter how much you're doing uh, transformation or cleanup, you're not going to catch that. So we have a log just the same, so every time the script runs, uh, we are actually using the API to create entities in CVCRM. And so uh, any time we have an error code back from the API, it's in the log file. We also have what we call warnings, which is basically we have some basic sanity tests on the data. Like if the first name is two characters, we know there's an issue. Um, that kind of thing. So we have some um, we have some sanity test, and then we issue warnings if uh, the data fails the sanity test. We had a few times to use the debugger as well. Uh, so we set a breakpoint because this is PHP code. We set a breakpoint in in a, in our code, and then we have a condition on that breakpoint. So you stop if the line number in Excel is 1,024, and it stops there and then we're in the PHP debugger. Uh, but I would say we've not used, we've not done that very often. Most of the time, the log and all the returns from the API uh, really tip us to what's wrong with the data. Uh, so I would love to show you this live, but unfortunately I don't have data that I can put up on a screen pr prepared for this. But uh, with Kettle, you can right click on any step and select the preview option and it will show you what the data looks like in the stream at that point in the stream. So as you've taken, you know, maybe three of your eight transformation steps. Uh, you can also set uh, breakpoints uh, and pause conditions. So you can say, you know, show it to me only when this field comes up blank. Uh, but often when, when, I'm, when I'm building a transform and debugging it, it's, it's, it's very powerful for me to say, okay, what does it look like here? At, yeah, at, at a particular step in the process, I can see exactly what the data looks like in a like an Excel table. Um, uh, lately, I've been <coughs> feeling higher priority uh, on the idea of improving the uh, the built-in importer. Uh, you know, um, we have a, a queue runner in City. It's used for the upgrade. Um, you. You know, it just seems maybe we need to use that queue runner to 
improve the import. It doesn't seem like it would be such a, a big pass. Well, it's not tiny, but... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's something that's come up a lot. Uh, Peter and I were actually thinking about taking a first look at it last year before I realized I wasn't going to be able to do the sprint. Um, I would actually love if the folks who are coming to the sprint who are interested in that can get together for like writing a spec. I've given a lot of thought to the process, and I actually don't think it would be quick or easy to do it right. Um, but there is this problem that anybody who needs the power of something like we're talking about goes outside the GUI and then the GUI gets neglected. Um, it would be great to at least make a wish list and see if we can break it up into chunks and maybe figure out how we can get to where Lola's talking about. Yeah, I would be um, duped to this as well. I don't think it'd be, it can be successful because the if you look at the importer today in CVCRM, it's very atomic. So you can import membership or you can if import events or individuals or organizations even that are separate. So if you have a file with individuals and organizations, you have to run that file twice through the importer. And uh, I think that's the biggest issue we have with this importer. And I don't think there's an easy way to change that because no. that's going to be a horrendous job. Uh, I've got yeah. a lot of thoughts on this. Let's talk at the sprint. A lot of the problem is the data coming in, just that you need to do some transformation or you need to clean it up or you need to do something with it, and that's all for case. Yeah, yeah and, and to, to that point of the data coming in, a lot of times yeah. what... We've encapsulated uh, a lot of these transforms in oh. PHP code already. Okay. So those transforms... Seems like we might have some follow-on discussions here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a boff today. Um, but one quick thing I wanted to uh, to echo here is, you know, Sometimes, I mean, we're talking about doing these uh, giant data imports and, and getting it all in place. And uh, again, a large data set might mean you've just got a lot of data points, uh, or it might mean fairly um, sh small d uh, amount of data points, but a large number of them, okay? Um, and that's one way to approach it is, you know, if, if, if you were to look at all your data and you've got, you know, 100,000 rows as in individual records and then you've got, you know, 80 different columns because you're importing all sorts of data, one way to uh, approach this problem is, is to simplify it, if you will. And sometimes we tell that to our clients is to say, okay, why don't we just start off and import a baseline of contacts and see where we are? And then we're going to go to the next layer and import the memberships. And then when we know that's in place, then we're going to focus on the contributions that are tied to those memberships or event registrations, et cetera, and break it down into separate steps. Um, because especially if it's very messy data, like we did a migration off of eTapestry. And this is another thing that you have to consider um, when you're dealing with the client and their export. eTapestry won't actually give you the uh, electronic files they will burn it onto a CD and mail it to you. Um, which, and, and they charge you per table export. So if you've got 250 tables, and I think they charge something like 35 or 50 bucks a table, y you know, it's not cheap just to get your data out of a system. And then you have to realize that one, you're, you're working with a certain data set that's a point in time. You spend X amount of time trying to configure it, and then they have to ask for another import, freeze that, wait for the CD to be mailed, then you cross your fingers and you hope that the, this is real story. I mean, this is, this is a reality that we deal with, is then you have to hope and cross your fingers that the data that's in the new data set doesn't have other types of exceptions compared to the f initial set of data. So you're doing at the very least this, this whole process twice. Um, so again, it's, it's a good idea to, to maybe approach your clients and say, you know what, why don't we just baseline it, put in, you know, contacts, addresses, phone numbers, and then memberships, then contributions, then events, then campaigns, then whatever it is that you're dealing with and break it up that way. If you have, again, if you have access to a live database or some kind of a stream or you're just dealing with some Excel spreadsheets, you know, having it all done at once might be, might be an option but it may not always be, which means just break it down into smaller blocks and do it over time. Um, I don't know if you guys, I don't think we talked about dedooping yet. Now, of course, there's dedooping on import with existing data. I think that's something we may be familiar with. But then there's dedooping the, the raw data, the source data, and cleaning that up. Um, how are you handling that? I'm looking it up with the API. 
that? Looking up with the API, PHP. So you just kind of importing a Lake City CRM and finding the dupes on import? I mean, we look for the dupes first. And if it's a dupe update, and if not, create. Yeah, we have, we have logic and the import importer itself that says go look for specific fields and if you find certain combination then update the record rather than import it in here. Right, so, so you're reading it record by record, so you're reading it record by record yeah. running against the API and then acting accordingly for each record instead Correct. of doing everything and then responding. Yeah. Okay. So are you talking about deduping in the data set that comes from the customer or deduping with the existing CVCRM data? Well, that's two different questions. I mean, it sounds like Peter is doing something, even if you're on a totally blank system, that you import contact one and then at contact two, you, you check your import to see if that was the same as contact one and you continue to do that with every single, let's say, contact that you put in, right? So you're just doing it at import even with a new system, right? Okay, so... Oh, yeah, that that's the premise, to, yeah. Another way to do it is to um, clean out your your <coughs> in an external system, do all your, without relying on the CDCR API, without doing it at import time, but cleaning it up in a separate step first and removing or merging those dupes. Are you doing anything like that, or are you just doing it at import time? No, uh, as data is flowing just like them. So um, I, I have my own DDoP functions for everything, you know, all the records, contributions, individuals, memberships, um, etc. And so I did up anything internally, and if it's valid, then I output to CVCRM. Okay, right. Okay. So I'm doing the did up, you know, as the data flows from the spreadsheets, and only putting back in CVCRM what's not a duplicate. Not a duplicate to the data set that you're importing, or not a duplicate to what's already in CVCRM? So, so that's the step that's new for this year. So new for this year, because up to now, I could only do blank imports, uh, but this year I had to do additional imports on top of an existing database, and I started dedupping with what's already in CV. Mm -hmm. And so I actually read the CV CRM as an additional data source in the import, um, and, and then use my internal dedup functions. Yeah, I think it sounds so, very, conceptually it sounds very appealing to say, let's dedupe the data before it starts flowing through the importer. Um, the, and, and we've tried to approach it with a couple of projects that way. Uh, and the short answer is, if the client had clean data or knew how to clean it up before it starts going through the importer, they wouldn't be needing us. I did dupe against Civi at import time. Yeah. Um, I have done a little bit of working with deduping the data as a separate kettle script before doing the what what a, a script against what was presumably now clean data. Uh, it turns out to be very tricky because um, what happens is now you merge two data, two, two contacts in your data set, and now you've actually got to keep a record of all of those yeah. um, because now your contribution IDs are, are not going to match up anymore yeah, against the, or, yeah, or the memberships ID. aren't going to match up because you just deleted one of those contacts. Um, we did do sort of a semi automated, semi manual process with that. And the results were okay, and my end impression was that at that point, I, I don't really feel comfortable without the client looking over what I've done, at which point I questioned whether or not it was worth pursuing that path versus using the Civi dedupe. Yeah. We used to trust whether that external ID they gave us was, you know, <laughs> being used for that. But after this, that experience, I don't trust the data at all, and I just assume we need to do a lot of checks. Yeah, well, one thing we did do is, um, to, to echo John's um, comment, you know, once you do the dedupe in the source data, then you have to keep track of it because then you have memberships or contributions or event registrations or whatever that ties back to that contact. Um, and we haven't had much luck with that. What we have done is, um, let's say they're going from 15 types of memberships down to five. So instead of trying to import 15 types of memberships and then change it in Civi, we try to go to the source data and say, okay, uh, these three types of memberships are now going to be this type, so change that data first before the import happens. And we've done it in SQL script. In that particular instance, we've done it in SQL scripts. Question for Julian Joe? Um, yeah, I don't think it's really that uh, appropriate for large uh, imports, but the migrate tool in Drupal that I think Eileen developed over a while, 
provides a nice mapping from uh, existing to new and allows your uh, contacts to review it. I understand. I haven't actually used it. Um, and they can do a manual review and you can do it several, you can do import several times. I, I just wanted to echo I, the the point you bring up about the about the matching the contributions the memberships the activities is not inconsequential at all. I mean it, it's it's huge, and sometimes it's an opportunity to with a large large data set now. But sometimes it's an opportunity to get the client using the dedupe tool to go through and do some of their own deduping and actually teach them how to use the tool because. You, I mean, we all know what happens when you don't have a regular DDU process after you've imported the data. You end up a year later with the same sort of situation you had before you got in the city. You raise an excellent point. You know, we're only talking about the data import here. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the data mapping and, and uh, the structures and everything else, the, the actual import, while it might be resource intensive for the server or it takes time, it's only a small slice of this. And still, that's not the last step, because the next step after that is data hygiene, right? What are you doing with the data? Because if the client ends up uh, mixing up and using the, the database they, the way, same way they used to, then a year later or six months later, you're going to end up with a bunch of the same problems. So that's another thing that I think is very important to consider is, you know, this shouldn't be a black box kind of a magic of the client gives us data, we import it, and we're done. S the outcome of it hopefully should be, hey, we noticed you have these types of general issues or these type of things. How can we prevent that from happening down the road? You're never going to get to perfection and clean data. Trust me, we've done a lot of imports, and just about every client says, oh, no, our data's clean, <laughs> and I haven't seen one yet. So... Hmm. Um, but I think the data hygiene and the best practices there as an ongoing process is very important. And we have some very, uh, you know, clients that are not necessarily technology sophisticated uh, technically, but they're very sophisticated in terms of understanding that the clean data is important and they're going through their database and looking at the relationships and the group memberships and the balances and et cetera and, and taking action on it. So <coughs> that's, that's the best thing we can do for our clients is educate them on the importance of it. Time's up. Thank you, everybody.